serious solutions for today, most importantly, for future generations. I yield the floor. Mr. President. Senator from Maryland is recognizing. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, uh, the budget document is a very important document. It speaks to the priorities of our nation, and it gives instructions to our committees to report out legislation consistent with that budget resolution. It gives instructions to the Appropriations Committee to pass appropriation bills and to other committees as it may affect revenues or mandatory spending. We have that budget document for the fiscal year that begins October 1st of this year. That was included in the Budget Control Act, uh, which passed this body by 74 votes. It has the force and effect of law. So our appropriations committees know the numbers for the appropriation bills for the year that begins October 1, and the other committees know what the requirements will be. The question is whether we should have a longer-term commitment on dealing with our budget problems. And we do need a bipartisan, credible program that involves not only the Democrats and Republicans in the Senate, but also the Democrats and Republicans in the House and the President of the United States. We need to avoid sequestration, and we need the predictability for our economy and for those who act upon our actions to know what the rules will be. We need to have a responsible plan to deal with the long-term deficit that's balanced and fair, that involves more revenue and spending cuts, that allows our recovery to continue and is bipartisan. And I want to compliment Senator Conrad for his leadership in giving us an opportunity to move in that direction. I think Senator Conrad showed tremendous leadership on behalf of the Democratic members of the Budget Committee to forego bringing forward a partisan budget, instead said, let's take a look at a long-term budget that can get bipartisan support, that's been tested, that's been out there, and that's called Bull Simpson. Now, we're talking about the broad outline. A budget document gives broad instructions to the committee. It's so-called the macro numbers. And I think the chairman has provided us the leadership on that issue. But don't get confused. We have a budget for the fiscal year that begins October 1. We have it earlier than we've ever had it, and it has the force and effect of law. Each of the four Republican plans that we will be voting on move us in the wrong direction to accomplishing those goals. They use almost all of the spending cuts that are included in these budgets are used for additional tax cuts and it benefits primarily those who really don't need an additional tax cut. The House Republican budget would provide $1 trillion in tax cuts for the wealthiest among us, giving millionaires on average a tax cut of $150,000. At the same time, that budget would ask our college students to pay more by allowing interest rates on their loans to increase, and they would ask our seniors to pay more by paying more for their Medicare benefits. They got it backwards. Those who have sacrificed the most during these economic times under the Republican budgets would be asked to pay more. Those who have benefited the most during that period of time would get additional tax cuts. That's not what we should be doing. It would hurt our economic recovery. It's irresponsible to make the type of cuts that are in the Republican budget that deal with American innovation Take a look what it would do for basic research in this country, which I would hope we all agree is necessary for America to continue to lead the world in innovation. In my own state of Maryland, I look at the jobs that we've created through the biotech field, by cybersecurity. Basic research is critically important to advance those job opportunities and, and economic opportunities for America. It would reduce our commitments for building our infrastructure. That's our transit systems, our roads, our energy grids. If we're going to be competitive, we need to rebuild America to meet the global challenges. It would reduce our commitments in education. An educated workforce is America's future. Investing in our children is what we should be doing. The quality of K through 12 would suffer. 
even pre-K, what they do with Head Start, and I've already mentioned the cost of student loans on post-secondary education would go up. For our seniors, they would be thrown into a voucher program on Medicare at the mercy of private insurance companies and asked to pay more and more and more when they're already overburdened by the cost of their health care. Under the Toomey budget, they would block grant Medicaid, throwing that burden onto our states. Our children and families would suffer. Under the Paul budget, Social Security benefits would be reduced on average by 39 percent. Social Security is a vital lifeline for the people of this country. And turning it into a program that becomes really a political football is not what we need for this country. And for our students, the cost of college education would be increased. We need to put forward a credible plan to reduce the deficit. We need to do this, and we've done it before. When Bill Clinton was President of the United States, I was serving in the House of Representatives, we passed a plan that balanced our federal budget, actually created surplus. How did we do it? We did it through a balanced approach. We did it through cutting spending and raising the revenue so we paid our bills. And what were the results? Our economy took off, creating millions of jobs. That's what we need to do again. How do we get this done? Let's get working together. Let's have Democrats and Republicans work together in order to come up with a balanced approach that has spending cuts, and those who can afford to pay more should be paying more because it's not fair to future generations for us to spend money today and ask our children and grandchildren to pay for it tomorrow. And let us protect the programs that are important for economic growth, for the dignity of our seniors, and for the welfare of our children. It starts with rejecting the extreme partisan budgets that our Republican colleagues are offering on the floor. And I urge my colleagues uh, to reject uh, those budget resolutions. And with that, Mr. President, I would yield the floor. Mr. President. Senator from Idaho is recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. I appreciate the efforts by our Republican leader, Mitch McConnell, and by the ranking member of our Senate Budget Committee, Jeff Sessions, to give the Senate a chance today to do its job. Mr. President, it has been more than three years since the Senate has passed a budget, almost 1,100 days, $4 trillion in increased debt since we last had a budget. And it, yet it seems as if the current majority are the only ones who don't think passing a budget is a part of our job. And I have to stop here for just a moment and commend the chairman of the Senate Budget Committee, Senator Conrad, because I know that he has fought mightily to get a budget to this floor. But the politics he faces have not allowed him to do so. And as of today, for 1,100 days, we have not been able to see a budget proposal reach the Senate floor from our committee. I've worked with Senator Conrad long and hard and will continue to do so on trying to get a broad bipartisan solution brought forward. But today we need to take action on the Senate floor. Everyone else has a budget. The House, the, the President has offered a budget. The House Republicans have offered a budget. The House Democrats have offered a budget. The Senate Republicans have introduced several budgets which we will vote on here today. Every American family and every American business has to develop a budget. Previous Congresses, including those that enacted the Congressional Budget Act last year, clearly saw the importance of Congress enacting a budget every year. In fact, it was that Congressional Budget Act that we were able to get put into place last year that put into effect the mechanism that we are employing today, which says that if the majority party leadership fails to bring a budget forward by the statutory deadline, then any senator has the right to call for consideration of any budget on the Senate calendar. So let's look at the budgets that we will be voting on today. First, we have the President's budget. At a time when our national debt is more than $15.6 trillion, well more than 100% of our gross domestic product, the President's budget seemingly makes no acknowledgment of the dramatic and predictable fiscal crisis that we face. Instead of embracing the comprehensive work of his own fiscal commission, 
the Bull Simpson Commission, which I served on, or any other of the key bipartisan proposals that are available, like the Ryan Wyden proposal or the Domenici Rivlin plan, or even coming up with a true reform plan of his own, the President's budget regrettably remains within the old, discredited framework of trying to tax and spend our way into prosperity. The President's budget would raise taxes by $2 trillion. And this is in addition to the $1.2 trillion of tax increases in the health care law, which are just beginning to take effect and will continue to roll out over the next few years. Perhaps even more remarkable, the President's budget actually increases spending by $1.2 trillion more than current law. So another $1.2 trillion in new spending, another 2 to $3 trillion in new taxes, no structural entitlement reform, and no discretionary spending reform. Even though it is widely acknowledged that the current path of our entitlement programs is unsustainable and that they are on track to soon become insolvent, the President's budget has no comprehensive reforms to our entitlement programs. None. The modest amount of health care savings he does propose would not even be enough to offset the extension of the doc fix or the other increases in the health care spending that he proposes. Mr. President, this is a dangerous approach and it should be noted that this budget failed by a vote of zero to 414 in the House. Yet we have no other pending proposal from the other side to consider. Today the Senate will also have an opportunity to reject the President's approach to the federal budget and I expect that it will do so just as it did last time. And because the Democratic majority here in the Senate has failed to produce their own budget, we will also have the opportunity to vote on some important budget proposals offered by the House Budget Committee Chairman and by our own colleagues here in the Senate, Senators Toomey and Paul and Lee. Each of these proposals would include true comprehensive reforms to our entitlement programs to prevent the impending insolvency and to protect the programs for current and future generations and would put us on a sustained pathway to balancing our federal budget. These budgets also call for comprehensive tax reform which take us out of the old paradigm of Congress debating whether to raise or cut taxes. And instead, these proposals would each, in their own way, dramatically streamline the tax code, reduce the tax rates, and unleash significant economic growth in our economy. A byproduct of this robust economic growth would be an increase in revenues to help us deal with our pending debt crisis. Mr. President, I want to again commend the Chairman, Senator Conrad, for his effort to bring forward a comprehensive plan, a solution, one that originated with the Bull Simpson Commission on which he and I sit or sat, and one which has then been worked on by the so-called Gang of Six for a significant amount of time now to improve and bring forward and one which the chairman is prepared to move when the opportunity is available. I've encouraged him to do it now. I believe we ought to have it on the floor today for this debate. But whenever the time becomes available, it's a proposal like this that we need to be dealing with. And we need to develop the bipartisan solutions that are the support that is necessary to pass it. And what is it? First of all, as we worked on the Bull Simpson Commission, we made some basic decisions. We concluded that spending was the major problem. That's where the major part of the solution should be. But that revenue was also critical to the solution. And that growing our economy was an important part of anything that Congress should do. We first discussed putting together a strong approach to entitlement reform, structural entitlement reform. We put strong spending caps in place. And we made clear that our spending patterns in the federal budget would be brought under control. In addition, recognizing the importance for a need of strong growth, we acknowledged the fact that our tax code must be reformed and not in the traditional battleground of whether to raise taxes on one group or lower taxes on another, but in a complete paradigm shift to focus on the fact of reforming both our corporate and individual tax codes. If you went about trying to create a tax code that was more unfair, more complex, more 
expensive to comply with and more anti-competitive to our own American business interests, you'd be hard-pressed to do it different or worse than we've done with our own tax code. And we concluded that we ought to reform that code to develop a strong, dynamic tax code for America to build forward with. And that's why we proposed broadening the base, reducing the rates, and reforming the way that we tax in America by simplifying our tax code and making America a strong, powerful, and robust economy as it historically has been. And then we put together what is critical for any plan to succeed, and that is an enforcement mechanism. Congress has a perfect record of violating its own budgets. Congress has a record of ignoring the budgets with simply getting 60 votes to waive the Budget Act whenever Congress wants to, ex to spend in excess of a budget. And literally, in every budget in the last two decades or more, Congress has done so. Republican or Democrat, the Congresses have done so. What we put together in our negotiations was an enforcement plan that would keep Congress within the walls of the budget that we adopt. It would have a series of points of order to protect against the declaration of emergencies unjustifiably and would then force even emergency spending that usually is just conducted outside the budget to be done in the face of a sequestration backed up by 67 vote points of order on the floor of the Senate. This kind of strong enforcement is also critical to what we must do to protect our nation. We need a comprehensive plan. We need to have entitlement reform. We need to have discretionary spending reform. And we need to have budget enforcement that is solid. We need to strengthen our revenue stream and reform our tax code by lowering the tax rates and broadening the base in such a way that simplifies the code and gives American businesses the opportunity to compete aggressively across this globe. If we do so, we will see a strong revenue component to our reform measures, and we will see a strong growth coming just out of the fact that we put together effective spending controls. But we've got to get there, and we've got to do it. And so in conclusion, Mr. President, I again want to say I appreciate the opportunity to work with Senator Conrad as we try to put this kind of a broad, comprehensive reform package together and build the bipartisan support for it. But I'm very discouraged still by the fact that we cannot get a budget proposal onto the floor of the Senate that we can work on. I also want to again appreciate the leadership of Senator McConnell and Senator Sessions, who have given the Senate the opportunity today to debate this issue and have votes at least on meaningful proposals that move us down the path of reform that I've discussed and put us into a pathway for economic prosperity and growth for all. America is at a ter terrible crisis point. Our national debt now exceeding over 100% of our GDP threatens our economy. Mr. President, we must take action. We cannot let another year go by without adopting a budget on the floor of the Senate. With that, Mr. President, I thank you and I yield the floor. I, uh, Senator from North Dakota. Senator Cardin, I, I would say to Senator Boxer, who is here, uh, if she would be prepared to go ahead. Uh, the situation we find ourselves in is we only have now 34 minutes left on our side. Could the senator uh, use seven minutes? Sure. I thank the senator very much for her cooperation. Uh, I, I'd say to other colleagues, uh, Senator Murray is here now. I'll, I'll wait next. All right. Senator Murray was scheduled to go uh, next. If Senator Murray, we, we've got a, a situation in which our time is rapidly fleeting. Uh, they have much more time left on their side than we do on ours. Could the senator do her presentation in seven minutes? Uh, I will attempt to do my best, sir. Very, very well. Senator Murray, for Senator, uh, seven minutes. Then we go to Senator Boxer. I ask unanimous consent, followed by Senator Boxer for seven minutes. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. President. And I want to thank Senator Conrad for his tremendous leadership. Uh, on this critical issue. Mr. President, at the end of last week, Republicans in the House of Representatives 
passed legislation that continues their mad dash away from the bipartisan Budget Control Act and really reflects the upside-down upside priorities that are guiding their party and stands absolutely no chance of passage here in the Senate. Mr. President, I think it would be very helpful to point at this point to remind my colleagues of the recent history that has brought us to this point. In August of last year, Democrats and Republicans came together and we agreed to the Budget Control Act to cut spending and put in place a process for additional deficit reduction. The purpose of that bipartisan agreement was to move towards serious deficit reduction and to give some consistency to the federal budget so the American people would not be threatened with a government shutdown every few months. Mr. President, that bipartisan deal sets the levels for next year's discretionary spending, which allows us in Congress to do our jobs and work to allocate federal resources towards investments in jobs and infrastructure and innovation and maintaining our commitment to our service members and their families and protecting and supporting middle class families and, and so much more. That was the agreement we came to. Senator Boehner, uh, Speaker Boehner shook on it. Minority Leader McConnell shook on it. Majority Leader Reid signed it and joined in many of my colleagues in voting for it. And then President Obama signed it into law. It became the law of the land. A law that I would add is binding, that replaces and carries more weight than a budget resolution, and that makes the budget resolutions we are debating today nothing more than political theater. Senate Democrats fully intend to honor our word and stick to the bipartisan budget levels for next year. And Senate Republicans in our Appropriations Committee, including the Minority Leader, recently voted to stick to those levels as well. But I was really disappointed that less than nine months after we shook hands on that deal, House Republicans turned right around and broke it. They put appeasing their extreme base ahead of the word they gave to us and the American people. And they demonstrated clearly that a deal with them isn't worth the paper it's printed on. But despite House Republicans reneging on the deal, the Budget Control Act is the law. It is signed. And we have so many challenges ahead of us as a nation. We cannot afford to re-litigate bipartisan deals every time members of the extreme end of the Republican Party make some noise at a meeting. But, Mr. President, House Republicans are not only trying to re-litigate that Budget Control Act, they want to pretend it never happened. As part of that deal, in addition to the $1 trillion in discretionary spending cuts, a Joint Select Committee on Deficit Reduction was formed to reduce the deficit by at least an additional $1.2 trillion. If that committee couldn't come to an agreement, the Bipartisan Budget Control Act put in place automatic spending cuts, sequestration, which spread evenly across defense and non-defense spending. We all knew at the time that sequestration was not the ideal way to reduce spending, but we wanted to have that in place so that Painful cuts were prominent and would help both sides to come to a bipartisan compromise. Mr. President, I was called on by the Majority Leader to co-chair that committee with Republican Representative Jeb Henserling, and I'm proud of the hard work that committee did do. And of course, as we know, I was extremely disappointed that in the end that committee was not able to come up with a bipartisan deal. But Mr. President, I want to be clear, because this is very relevant today. We weren't able to get a deal because Republicans refused to even consider tax increases on the wealthiest Americans. The talks fell apart around that issue and that issue alone. I came to the table with many of my colleagues with proposals for serious compromises on spending and a willingness to move forward with smart changes to strengthen entitlements. We knew many of these compromises would be painful, but we were willing to put them forward to get to a bipartisan deal and a balanced deal. But as much as we offered, we couldn't get our Republican colleagues to give an inch when it came to taxes on wealthiest Americans and biggest corporations. Even though the rich are paying the lowest tax rates today in generations, they were fundamentally opposed to any plan that would call on the wealthy to pay a penny more in taxes. And in poll after poll, 
Americans today overwhelmingly say they want to see a balanced approach to tackling the deficit and debt that puts everything on the table, including revenue. And every single bipartisan group that has come together to tackle this, Simpson Bowles, Domenici Rivlin, Gang of Six, all of them have included a balanced approach that does reduce spending and raises revenues. Because everyone knows that's the only real and fair way to tackle this challenge, and it simply doesn't make any sense to solve this problem with cuts alone. So as we watch House Republicans rolling back the automatic cuts they don't like and acting like the Bipartisan Budget Control Act never happened, I say to them today what I said to Republicans in the Joint Select Committee. We will not allow the debt and deficit to be reduced on the backs of our middle class and most vulnerable Americans without calling on the wealthiest to contribute as well. It's not fair, it's not what American people want, and it's not going to happen. We are facing these automatic cuts because Republicans continue put, put, putting protecting the rich above all else. And unless that changes before the end of the year, our country is going to have to face the consequence of intransigence. Mr. President, Republicans in the House of Representatives are not only acting like the BCA never happened, they are highlighting the moral and intellectual bankruptcy of a party that out allows itself only to think in terms of cutting, shrinking, eliminating, and never in terms of investing and growing and fairness. The legislation they passed would roll back sequestration for next year by simply taking funding from programs middle class families and the most vulnerable Americans count on and shifting it to defense. I would ask the uh, Senator from North Dakota if I could have one additional minute. Yes. Senator is recognized. Mr. President, they want all the deficit reduction from the Budget Control Act without any bipartisan compromise or shared sacrifice. The choices we make as a body in the coming months will affect every single American. Mr. President, as we have said from the start, we will put everything on the table, but that word is everything. We cannot come to a solution in America unless everybody contributes shared sacrifice. That's the principle we have been fighting for. It is the one we will continue to fight for. And Mr. President, that is what the American people want. And I'm proud to stand with my party to continue to fight for that. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the floor. And I ask that the balance of my statement be printed in the record as if read. Without objection. Mr. President. Senator from California is recognized. Mr. President, I rise to say that it is stunning to see the Republican Party running away from a bill that they supported, from a deal that they cut, a deficit reduction deal that was led by Senator Conrad, the Budget Control Act, which is a law of the land. And instead, they're offering up a series of budgets that I believe will destroy this country. Why do I say that? Because they destroy the middle class and they give to the millionaires and the billionaires. That is a recipe for a third world nation, the haves and the have-nots. And I hope the American people wake up and pay attention because a budget is really a statement of who we are as a people. I was proud to serve on the budget committee. I wish I was still on there, but I had other options and I, for my state, I decided to leave the budget committee and go on the commerce committee. And I want to tell you something. That's a tough committee. That's one tough committee. And we are going to miss Senator Conrad. His leadership is exemplary. And he has explained why the replacement budgets that the Republicans have offered just are unworkable. Some of them don't even make any sense. But I have to tell you, this is serious business because one of them did pass the House. And they not only passed the House, but then they passed another law, we call it reconciliation, which is dangerous in what they did. So let me tell you what they did. And let me be clear, because it is not difficult to explain. What they did is stand up with all their heart, with all their soul, with all their power and their fervor to fight for the 1%. 
They are fighting for the millionaires, the multimillionaires, the billionaires, the trillionaires, you name it. That's who they're fighting for. They're giving them back an average of $150,000 a year. And over the 10-year period, that average millionaire can write a big kiss to the Republicans if this ever became law, because they would get back $1.5 million over the 10-year period. And how do they pay for this largesse? How do they pay for this warm, fuzzy hug to the people that have everything? They cut the heart out of the middle class. And I'll give you some examples. They would allow student loan rates to double so that students would have to pay not a three percentage point uh, interest rate on their student loans, but over six percent. They will cut the heart and soul out of America's infrastructure. Did you ever look at the construction industry lately? Well, there's 1.4 million unemployed construction workers. We need to make sure they're building the roads and the 70,000 bridges that are deficient and the highways. Half of our roads don't meet the standard. We need to rebuild America, as the president said. Not Afghanistan, not Pakistan. Thank you very much. Iraq, the blood of our people are on the ground over there. It's time to spend that money here, as our president has said. But oh no, they continue all that war spending. They add to that war spending. And they expect everybody else to stand back and quietly accept a doubling of their student loan rate, a cut in the transportation program. They end Medicare, period. They're going to turn it into a voucher system, and, and our elderly are going to have to negotiate to try and find a way to pay for health insurance. And thousands of dollars more it will cost them. One of these budgets actually cuts Social Security by 39%. Senator Conrad, am I right on that point? Imagine a Social Security recipient living on, you know, $18,000, getting a cut of almost 40%. So this is what they're doing, folks. They eliminate the Department of Education. They eliminate many of them the ability for people to pay for their energy assistance in the winters. They walk away from alternative energy, which is going to free us from foreign oil and make us safer. That's what they do. And they do it all in the name of tax breaks for the people in America who, I'm very proud of them, they made it. They made it. And I got to tell you, in my state, a lot of those folks who have made it have written to me and said, Senator, we want to have everybody have the chance we had. But the Republicans, their only passion is for those that have. They practice Robin Hood in reverse. They even, in one of the budgets, I think it's the Ryan budget, they tax the poorest people. They tax the poorest people. They raise taxes on the poorest people, and they cut taxes on the richest people. Robin Hood in reverse. Isn't that sweet? Isn't that kind? Not. So they bring America to its knees. They walk away from the Budget Control Act. You know why they don't like it? Because it forces spending across the board. I don't like that. But we are serious about deficit reduction. In my closing remarks, I'm going to say this. In the last 40 years, one party balanced the budget. In the last 40 years, one party created a surplus. That happens to be the Democratic Party and a Democratic president named Bill Clinton. How did we do it? We met each other halfway. We said, you know what, when you're faced with a crisis, You've got to put everything on the table and everybody makes a little bit of a sacrifice. It's no big deal. You ask the people who have the most to do a little more and you find ways to cut spending. That's what we did in the Clinton years. And you know what happened? 
We created, I think it's 23 million new jobs, Mr. President. 23 million new jobs. We balanced the budget, we created a surplus, and now we have to listen to the demagogues over there lecture us about how to balance the budget. Wrong. We know how to do it. You don't know how to do it. All you know how to do is stand up and attack our president. When our president inherited this terrible deficit from George W. Bush, who took a surplus, Bush did, and turned it into deficits as far as the eye can see. And we were losing, and I would ask for 30 additional seconds. Senators recognize. We were losing, remember, how many jobs a month? 800,000 jobs a month when our president took over. The country was falling apart. He saved the auto industry. It's back on top when others said, let them go bankrupt. He started the job creation. It's not good enough. But I'll tell you one thing. If we're going to get it better here, we better start working together. Let's live by the Budget Control Act. It's the law of the land. And let's use that time to find a long-term solution like we did in the Clinton years. Thank you very much, and I yield the floor. Mr. President, Senator from Alabama. Now, I just want to make a, a reference to the Budget Control Act. I, one of my colleagues said the Republicans are running away from the Budget Control Act, and I would suggest that's not accurate. Uh, in truth, uh, the Budget Control Act was a cap on spending, and the Republicans have proposed that we spend less than that, as any economist would tell us we need to do because it wasn't sufficient. And the difficulty arises, however, when you consider what President Obama proposed with regard to the Budget Control Act. It's amazing. President Obama signed in August a Budget Control Act as an agreement to raise the debt ceiling uh, by $2.1 trillion in, ex in exchange for reducing spending by $2.1 trillion. And he signed that, and it went into effect, and it is the current law today. But when he proposed his budget in January of this year, that we'll vote on later today, I expect not to get a, it will not get a single vote, and it should not. President Obama's budget wiped out half of that saving, $1 trillion, and those savings were wiped out, and he replaced it with almost, uh, and he added more spending in addition. And, uh, uh, Mr. President, I was having a little trouble thinking here. The Senate will be in order. The Senator will I suspend. I thank you, Chair. Senator will suspend for a moment. And um, Senator's recognized. So I, I think the dramatic event that's gone unappreciated is that the president's budget eviscerates the Budget Control Act and puts us on, back on the full speed tax and spend course. I see my colleague, Senator Enzi here, a senior member of the Budget Committee, has been involved in so many of the important issues. He himself is an accountant, a small businessman, uh, and uh, he understands the real world and the value of a dollar. Mr. President, I would yield to Senator Enzi. Mr. President, Senator Wyoming is recognized. I thank the ranking member of the committee and I thank him for all of his work on this issue and the suggestions that he has and uh, the importance of what we're doing today. So I rise today to discuss our nation's budget situation and the budget proposals that we'll vote on later today. While I'm pleased that my colleagues have put forth a number of good ideas, this debate is long overdue. The Congressional Budget Act sets a statutory deadline of April 1st for the Senate Budget Committee to report a budget resolution and a deadline of April 15th for completion of a congressional budget. Despite these statutory deadlines, it's been more than three years since the United States passed a budget and the majority party once again refuses to debate this important topic through the normal budget process. We did not mark up a budget in the Senate Budget Committee, and we've not been given the opportunity to offer amendments to any of the budgets that are before us on the Senate floor. That's disappointing. With a national debt approaching $16 trillion, it's hard for me to even say, 
16 trillion dollars. I saw a kid with a t-shirt and it said, please don't tell them what comes after a trillion. But with 16 trillion dollars, we cannot afford to continue operating without a budget. That's a blueprint to put the country on a sustainable fiscal path in both the short term and the long term. And we better be looking at that long term as well. We cannot continue to simply spend money that we don't have without a plan to get our spending under control. And we're so bad on spending that we're, we're taking 10 years worth of revenue to pay for two years worth of projects. And those are projects that will continue after that. I don't know what we do after the two years. How far out can you borrow for money that may not even come in because it might not even be budgeted? A budget's supposed to do just that. It's supposed to put spending under control. But instead, for the third year in a row, it looks like the Senate majority will refuse to pass a plan to help fix the fiscal crisis we face. <clears throat> in the three years since the Senate majority passed a budget, <clears throat> our country has spent approximately 10 and 4 tenths trillion dollars. We've accumulated around 4.5 trillion in gross debt which translates to an additional $15,000 for every man, woman, and child. $15,000 for every man, woman, and child, which brings it up to about $49,000 total for every man, woman, and child. Since we last adopted a budget, we've spent more than $626 billion on net interest payments to service the debt alone. These are unsustainable levels of spending. And yet the majority continues to ignore the problem and refuses to take these numbers seriously and consider much less pass a budget. The majority argues that we have a budget in place because of the passage of the Budget Control Act, which also governed our spending in fiscal year 2011. But if that truly governed what we're doing, why did the president even submit a budget to us? If that was the budget, he shouldn't have gone to all the effort to put his own budget together. But he felt that he needed to put a budget together. Um, in fiscal year 2011, the government brought in slightly more than two and three tenths trillion dollars in revenue. At the same time that we collected two and three tenths trillion dollars, we spent 3.6 trillion dollars. In other words, we overspent by one and three tenths trillion dollars. That's more than 50% of the revenue that we were expecting. We're on pace for another trillion dollar deficit this year. The Budget Control Act may include some spending limits, but with record trillion dollar deficits, the Budget Control Act cannot replace an actual budget that puts in place long-term spending cuts and helps get our country back on the path to balance. Again, if that Budget Control Act really took care of everything, the president would not have needed to submit a budget. He did. Now, I applaud the president for appointing a deficit commission. We tried to pass that as a bill here. It came close, but it didn't make it. And he saw that that was a need, and he appointed a commission. And the chairman of the commission was, uh, was co-chaired by Erskine Bowles and Senator Alan Simpson. And they painted a pretty bleak picture for our country. And more than a year and a half has gone by since they painted that bleak picture, and it's gotten worse, not better. Now, I really expected at the State of the Union that year that the president would have painted the same bleak picture that he'd been handed by the Deficit Commission. It's scary. It's now scarier. But he didn't. Instead, he gave us another stimulus budget. I think if he would have painted the bleak picture in the State of the Union that was handed to him by the Deficit Commission, if he would have painted that same picture, not placed a solution out there, painted the picture so America would understand where we are with the debt and the deficit, if he would have done that, he could have come out with a budget that was parallel to what Simpson Bowles had and I think we would have had a solution over a year ago. We have a nearly $16 trillion debt and it keeps growing. It's unaffordable and we need to make a change. What will happen if we don't act and if we don't cut spending? We won't be able to afford the military we need. 
People will have drastically reduced Social Security checks. Roads won't be fixed. All of our money will go toward paying interest on the debt. People shouldn't doubt that this is real. There were riots in the streets in Greece when their government was forced to deal with the realities of debt. In the United States, we owe $49,000 for every man, woman, and child. In Greece, they only owed $39,000 and had to make drastic cuts. And they had riots in the streets. Now they've stepped back with the recent elections and are trying to turn away from the reality of their debt. Does that sound familiar? I have news for you. Our debt per person, as I mentioned, is more than Greece's debt per person. It's more than Italy's debt per person. <clears throat> In fact, the United States owes more than all of the Euro countries and the United Kingdom put together. Now, my Republican colleagues and I have put forth a series of budgets that would help to improve the fiscal situation. I've drafted legislation that redu would reduce spending by 1% per year until we reach balance. By reducing spending by 1%, we can achieve balance by fiscal year 2017. That's a 1% reduction per year to 2017. And most of the people that I've talked to, and I talked to a lot of people in Wyoming and some other places around the country, have said 1% is not bad. 1% is definitely not bad if you have to compare it to a possibility of a 19% cut when we step off the cliff. The House of Representatives passed a budget last year that cut spending by five and eight-tenths trillion dollars. This year, the House passed a second budget that would reduce the deficit by four and four-tenths trillion in comparison to the President's budget over the next decade, which does nothing to improve the short or long-term economic outlook of the country. In fact, President Obama's budget would make things worse. Senator Toomey has put together a detailed budget plan that would balance the budget within eight years. It would enact corporate tax reform and it would adopt important changes to the entitlement programs that are the drivers of the nation's unsustainable debt. Senator Paul has put forth a budget that would balance within five years. Of course, it eliminates four departments and it reduces spending by eight trillion over the next ten years. And it seems radical. But we're facing a cliff and he's willing to put a budget out there. Senator Lee has also introduced a budget that balances our budget by fiscal year 2017. It's by cutting spending by seven and one-tenths trillion over the next ten years. And it, too, reforms Medicare and Social Security. Why do we have to reform Medicare? Well, in the health care reform bill, we took half a trillion dollars out of Medicare. It was already going broke. But, don't worry, we put in a special panel that will tell where cuts can come each and every year. And if we don't suggest different cuts, those go into effect without a vote of the, of the United States Senate. Half a trillion dollars. The only places they can cut are doctors, hospitals, nursing homes, home health care, and other providers. If you don't have a doctor, I don't think you have much medical care. So there are going to have to be reforms in Medicare. We've already forced that. And Social Security, there aren't as many people working now as will soon be on Social Security, and that creates problems. Now, I don't agree with everything that's included in these budgets that I mentioned, but I want to commend my Republican colleagues for making tough choices and putting forth solutions. While they've been doing that, President Obama and the Senate majorities ignored the problem and refused to acknowledge the need to cut spending. They've demonized Republicans and suggested that it's our intention to harm seniors, poor people, and children. One advertisement showed a picture of House Budget Chairman Ryan pushing an elderly woman off a cliff. That kind of rhetoric doesn't help anything. That rhetoric's over the top, while their solutions have been non-existent. Last year, President Obama's budget was such an empty proposal that it failed by a vote of 0 to 97 in the Senate. In the House this year, his latest budget failed by a vote of 0 
to 414. And I suspect that it may face the same fate when it's considered later today, the same one they voted on. Not a single member of either party was willing to support the budgets, the president's budget proposal. How is that for leadership? You know, in some of the countries that have a parliamentary form of government, they've heard about these votes and are terribly shocked because in their country it would call for a special election and a new prime minister. So we'll be voting on five budgets later today, four from Republican members and President Obama's budget. Absent from the discussion is a budget produced by the Senate majority. That's shirking the responsibility to govern. We're in too serious a situation to continue ignoring the budget problems we face. At a time when the national debt breaks down to more than $49,000 for every person in Wyoming and across this country, we can't afford to continue business as usual. We can't continue punting the tough decisions simply because the tough decisions might impact our re-election campaigns. The decisions that are painful today will be even more painful in the future. We talk about pay-fors here when people want to do a new program or continue an old program with additional expenses. But we better start including the debt our debt is greater than the value of everything that we produce in this country in a year. That's the gross national product. The debt's greater than the gross national product. There are a lot of stories about what happens when your debt gets greater than the gross national product, and none of them are good. I've heard from a lot of people in Wyoming about the national debt and the lack of a budget for more than three years. While they have differing viewpoints on the best solution, they have one common message. Do something. Do something. And do it as soon as possible. I'm concerned that after votes, we'll end up in the same place we started, without a budget and without a fiscal plan to get our nation's debt and deficit in check. I don't know about you, but it's keeping me up nights. Some of my colleagues have offered plans to make that happen. Those who control the Senate appear content to sit on the sidelines and criticize. While that happens, we continue to add trillions of dollars to our national debt. I'd encourage my colleagues on the other side of the aisle to think about what it means to future generations and join us in finding a plan to fix our fiscal woes. And I know that's what they're thinking about because I've been in meetings off of the Hill where they've talked about this same thing. But we've got to solve it. We can't just talk about it. And we can't give it lip service when we're off of the floor and excuse it when we're on the floor. I yield the floor. Senator from Alabama. Before Senator Anzi leaves, he made reference to the fact that in the European parliamentary system um, that when a prime minister proposes a budget that fails, uh, that would be cause for a collapse of the government and a new election. And he also uh, correctly recalled how the deficit commission that was appointed by President Obama uh, came back with a number of recommendations that would have gone far more, far further than the president's budget in dealing with our debt course. But I just would, would ask him about that moment he mentioned when after the debt commission reported and the president came before the joint session of Congress uh, to state, to give the state of the union, was the senator surprised and disappointed that the president virtually ignored the debt commission, uh, did not take the opportunity to explain to this whole audience of American people that we are on an unsustainable course that could lead to financial catastrophe? Mr. President, I, I was uh, both surprised and disappointed. Uh, I thought he had a unique opportunity and it had been handed to him on a platter that he designed. He appointed these people and they put a lot of hours into it, uh, including the senator from North Dakota who's here, and uh, came up with a plan. Now, it, it wasn't a pleasant plan by anybody's 
imagination. It was an important plan by everybody's imagine. Well, evidently not everybody or we would have adopted it by now. But uh, it had some critical things in there that uh, should be taken care of, should be considered in a budget, and uh, should have leadership coming from the White House. That's where leadership on budgets happens. Uh, I remember being in the Wyoming legislature, and we have a requirement there that you have to balance the budget each and every year. And uh, we, we do that. Now, if you find out there's going to be a deficit before the legislature meets, when they only meet for 20 days in the, in the budget year, and if you know about it before that time, then the legislature has to make those cuts. Now, one of the things I noted was that when we made the cuts, the, um, the people in the administration picked out something that was really painful and made that cut so that the constituents out there would say, oh, that really hurt those stupid legislators, you know, picked the wrong things. Well, it wasn't the legislators that picked the wrong things. It was the people in charge of each of those trying to make sure that the legislature felt pain. Now, if that deficit is noted outside of the time that the, the few days that the legislature meets, then the governor has to make the cuts. Now, virtually everybody in the administration works for the governor. So when he made the cuts, they took the priorities and they chopped off the lowest priorities. And so it really wasn't noticeable around the state and it works out well. Um, that's leadership. That's tough leadership because the governor doesn't like to have to be the one that's uh, held up for all the scrutiny of what, what's spent. But that's what the president has to do. That's the president's job, to get this bad budget back in balance. And uh, there are some examples around the world where when they put the budget in on a path to ba balancing, the economy comes up. Yes. That gives people a little bit of confidence in what can happen. Right now, there's not a lot of confidence around this country. And so the economy is dropping. But a good budget that follows a plan that gets us in fiscal stability would make a huge difference for this country and stimulate business. I couldn't agree more. I do believe that the debt course we're on, which is unsustainable, every expert and the witnesses that come before the Budget Committee on which Senator Enzi and I serve have told us it's unsustainable. And if we get off of it and tighten our belts and do things like Governor Bentley in Alabama is doing, Governor Christie's had to do, Governor Brown's now facing in California. They've let that state get so far it's going to be hard, so far out of control it's going to be difficult to bring it back. But uh, they have to make tough choices. So uh, if we do that, I believe we will get some positive impact on the economy just from the confidence that restores. Senator Conran, and I see Senator Lieberman's here, and, and uh, uh, I would be willing to yield back if, that, if, if, it's, if you're ready to use some time now. Now, can I just say to my colleague, uh, we have 17 minutes left on this side. We have four senators left to speak. You've got, I think, probably 54, 53 minutes left, something like that. So. Senator Lieberman, if you could take about four minutes, if that would work for you. I was, I was hoping for four and a quarter minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll do my... Sold. <laughs> Deal four minutes to the senator from our side. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, a flat eight, not a... Pardon? You'd have a flat eight minutes. With... Oh, that's, that's very generous of you, my friend. <laughs> Uh, I thank uh, uh, Senator from North Dakota, Senator from Alabama, I th Alabama and I thank the chair. Um, I've been listening to some of the statements being made. They're, they're, they're quite sincere, they're quite interesting, uh, but uh, I'm afraid that in the end they're, they're not going to signify very much except good intentions. We've got ourselves in a position here where we all know that the country has a terrible problem. Uh, we're living, uh, we're spending a lot more than we're bringing in. Uh, and and in the, the simplest way to explain it is that uh, last time I looked, I think I'm still close on this, uh, revenues of the federal government are about 15 or 16 percent of gross domestic product. Spending of the federal government is about 25 percent of gross domestic product. There you've got a yawning enormous uh, deficit which adds up now to a long-term debt of over 15 trillion dollars and we can't go on like this 
and, and be a great country. We can't go on like this and, and have any hope of economic recovery. I happen to agree, uh, I should say in gratitude for the extra time Center of Sessions has given me, I happen to agree with the last thing he said that I think, and I'm not alone, I think people on both sides some feel this, which is that the best thing we can do for our economy and economic growth is to adopt a bipartisan long-term uh, program that will reduce and hopefully eliminate our debt. Why? Because it will restore confidence in the American economy. We all know that jobs don't come from government. They shouldn't come from government or in government. Uh, jobs that, that people want, need, uh, come from the private sector. And the last time I looked, the private sector, American business, was sitting on somewhere between two and three trillion dollars of liquid assets that they're not spending. And why aren't they spending it? They have, no, they have very little confidence in the future. Not just confidence about how the economy is going to be, but what we're going to do, what the, what the government's going to do. And I think if we adopted a long-term bipartisan debt reduction program that gave them some sense of security about what taxes and spending policies we're going to do uh, for some years ahead, they would start to invest that two to three trillion dollars again, and that would create uh, hundreds of thousands of jobs that people desperately need uh, who are trying so hard uh, to get back to work. And look, basically, we know what we've got to do to make this happen. It's to state it bluntly, it's got to be a combination of tax reform and entitlement reform. We've got to raise revenues so they get back up to 18, 19, 20 percent, and we've got to bring spending down. And most of the spending increases are coming from entitlements to about 18 or 19 percent of GDP so we can be in balance. It's not, uh, it's not very mysterious how we're going to do this, but it, the political will is not there now uh, to, to make those tough decisions. And uh, so today is a classic moment. We've got these budget resolutions that are before us as a matter of privilege. They're privilege matters. Um, I, I really have wanted to vote to proceed to some of them just to get on the subject matter, hoping that maybe the door would be open for direction uh, to various committees to, to come back with long-term solutions to the, as I've talked about. We all know that the Bowles-Simpson model is the one that we're going to eventually get to. And the question is, how, how close do we get to the fiscal cliff? Or is our country falling, going over the cliff, falling down, and finally we, we rush in here and in a panic rescue it with something like Simpson-Bowles? Uh, uh, the, the, the closest Senate proposal that would do what we need to do is the one that my friend from North Dakota has, has tabled in the Budget Committee. I wish we could vote on it. Um, I don't know how many votes we'd get, but I, I wish we could at least start the process. I know everybody says we're going to come back after the election and, and there's going to be a burst of courage, I, I guess, because the election's over, and we're going to do the Simpson Bowles tax reform, entitlement reform. I, I don't, I, what I'm sort of hearing in the wind around here is don't count on it. I, I hope so. Senator Conrad and I, it's going to be our uh, last couple of months on this particular stage. And um, uh, there's nothing I know he would like more to be part of, and I, know, I could tell you nothing I'd like more to be part of than doing a, a, a bipartisan long-term debt reduction program. But I'm, I'm fearful that it's asking an awful lot of this system in a short period of time, and the tendency will be uh, to protect us from falling off the cliff by extending everything that's going to expire at the end of the year, stopping the sequestering, stopping the end of the Bush tax cuts. Uh, I hope I'm wrong, but I, and I know there are some bipartisan groups I've been part of that are working to get ready for that point, um, but, uh, uh, and that's important work because it just can't spring uh, out of nowhere. But our, our country's future is at stake, the future of, of, of the greatest economy in the history of the world. And, and because of our irresponsibility is the only thing I can say, and we've all been part of it. I, I take blame for part of it. Uh, we're, we're not uh, doing what the country uh, needs us to do. 
So uh, I'm going to vote against the motions to proceed because each of the, the uh, proposals before us doesn't really achieve anything near what we need to do in terms of a balance, entitlement reform, tax reform. Uh, and uh, I, I do want to say one other thing, which uh, I hope we can get to soon. To say the obvious, but sometimes it's important to say it, the existing budget process ha has broken down. It doesn't work. It's not related to the reality of the economic or political uh, uh, times that we're in. Uh, so that the budget process, it doesn't work. And uh, let me cite a couple of statistics. Not uh, since early in 2009 has the Congress managed to actually pass a real annual budget resolution. I know the Budget Control Act does some of the things a, a, a budget resolution would do, but not all of them. Uh, and and, it, and that's, it doesn't do what the budget the reform of 74 called on us to do. Listen to this. Only four times in the last 35 years, four times in 35 years, have the appropriations bills been completed prior to the beginning of a new fiscal year? I mean, who, what business, well, what other government entity could operate like that? 1996 was the last time Congress successfully passed all the appropriations bills prior to the beginning of a new fiscal year. And we know it because we've been here over and over again. Congress. Uh, slides from one temporary short-term appropriations bill to the next months into the fiscal year until we finally throw it into one big hodgepodge, which is not really responsible government, and a lot gets hidden in it. So I, I want to raise the question. I know my friends on the Budget Committee have thought about it. Um, really, we ought to, do I sense that my time is over? Last sentence. I, I wonder whether we need a, a commission uh, to, uh, to take a look in a short period of time, six months, at the budget process we're following now, and make recommendations for a new process that will work. Maybe it's just a lack of political will and an inability to... He, he, he provides to Mr. Barrow, uh, provides some real valuable insights in that. And with regard to Senator Lieberman, I do uh, think that the budget process uh, can work. It should be able to work, but it won't work if we don't try to make it work. Under certain circumstances, it's hard to get a bipartisan government, uh, uh, budget if you don't have everybody together. But, uh, so maybe it is worth examining whether we can make improvements there. But, but Mr. Barrow...